I'd like to share with you today how a accurate and repeatable scanner is designed. And this will give you some uh, pointers to look for when you are shopping for a scanner. The key to measuring with infrared technology is using a very accurate infrared sensor. They come in a little transistor case. They look like that. And the sensor has a window. Inside the sensor is a very sensitive set of thermocouples that will be warmed by any incoming infrared heat. And they're very, very, very sensitive. If you don't have some way of focusing your target on that sensor, it's basically looking at an ever widening area for its temperature measurement. So without any, without a lens, without any focusing, if we had a warm dot here, or let's say we were scanning a person and we were scanning their spine, and as you know, the dermatones go this way, and if we're scanning and want to create an accurate record, we want to be able to have our, if you will, pixel size be small enough to detect changes in temperature from dermatone to dermatone, and very, very precisely. Otherwise, we can miss very small temperature changes that are critical to determining if a person is in pattern or repeating a uh, temperature profile and not adapting to their environment. So we want to measure this small size dot, about 0.3 inches in diameter, which is about the size of the thermocouples on BJ's original scanner. But our sensor, our infrared sensor, without any help, is looking at a very large area and would miss the temperature change, a small temperature change on that spot. So what we start to do in our design is, one, we want to limit the view. And what that uh, takes in the real world is a barrel whose bore is about the same size as the thermocouple head on the original NCM. BJ did a lot of research and came up with that diameter very accurately. So we put a two inch deep barrel in front of that sensor to limit just like it blinders on a horse so that it doesn't look all over the place but focuses forward, that limits only parallel infrared rays to enter and finally get close and reach the sensor. To further enhance, we want a lens here that takes those parallel rays and brings them down to focus on a very small spot within that sensor. The difference in temperature between the scanner and the sensor in the barrels and the target this is the target, the temperature of the man the difference in temperature between what it's looking at and its own temperature is what the infrared sensor gives us. So it's the temperature difference between itself and the target. Pretty simple. If the temperature of the scanner head, for instance, in your uh, in your office is, let's say, it's 70 degrees.
And the temperature output from the sensor is 20 degrees. We know that the target that we're looking at is 90 degrees. If we know the temperature of the scanner head, and we have the output from the infrared sensor, and we add them together, 20 and 70, we have 90 degrees. This is why when you are using the scanner, we have a thermal barrier or a gasket between the head of the scanner, which houses the infrared sensors, and the handle. As you can appreciate, as you hold the scanner, you will warm up the handle. The gasket or thermal barrier allows the head to only warm up very, very, very slowly. Any slow changes in temperature of the head are compensated for within the circuitry and we remain reading very accurately. This is why we ask you to always hold the scanner by the handle. When you place it in the base, place it in the base holding the handle. If you were to hold your hand on one side of the head for even three or four seconds, you would find that the middle graph on your graphing screen would be shifted off to one side and it would take about three or four minutes to come back to center. That's why we don't like the scanner when it is not being used sitting next to a warm computer or near a window where sunshine is coming in and warming up one side more than the other. We want the head of the scanner to be of a uniform temperature. Now, measuring the temperature accurately is one, only one portion of being able to do graphs that are repeatable enough to overlay. Um, one of the things that I wanted to share, again, in the design of a scanner and why our scanner only has two barrels. In order to maintain that balance on the head of the scanner, the circuitry that is within the scanner must be laid out, the circuit board itself, must be laid out equally placing amplifiers on both sides equal distance from the center so any small amount of heat that the electronics generates is generated equally on both, within the head on both sides. You can't have three or five or any number other than two barrels on a device and expect it to be stable and remain stable. The other secret to being able to overlay your graphs very well for being able to do accurate, repeatable work is the ability to measure distance. The Titron, early Titron scanners used a wheel with alternating black and white lines in a circle. And as the wheel turns, Light, you can see there's a small red light bouncing off that inside of that wheel. Light bounces off these alternating white and black lines and as the wheel turns, a photo detector responds and gives us pulses every 170 second of an inch as the wheel turns. And we calibrate that out so it reads in centimeters on your computer screen as you scan a patient. On the new C5000 and C6000 scanners, that wheel with the alternating black and white lines is actually inside a hub. So you, you, don't act, you won't see these lines, but they're there. When you pull the trigger on the scanner, Nothing happens as far as data recording until you start to move. As you, as you move, whether slow or fast, data is taken every incremental step as that wheel turns. In the middle of a scan, if you just stop, keep your trigger pulled, and hold, 
no data is taken. So you can talk to the patient, move a bra strap out of the way, and continue on. So just wanted to share that on how, what it takes to make an accurate instrument. To show that kind of accuracy, I'd like to move to the screen. These are some graphs taken on myself when I was graphed. The two on the right were taken in January of 2001. These are two cervical graphs. I will overlay them to show you the kind of repeatability that is required in order to see if the body is locked in a temperature pattern that is not responding to the environmental changes. This, these two lines represent two graphs taken on that day on the right side of my spine. These were read by the right barrel of the scanner. These were read by the left barrel of the scanner. The center graph is what you would have received or seen with the traditional thermocouple device that can only measure differences. So this is the difference in temperature from left to right. If we go back now and go back, let's say, I'm sorry, go forward to 2011 and bring up these two graphs as well. Okay, these were from 2011. These are the newer graphs. Unfortunately, and we'll, we'll bring them all up together and you'll see, unfortunately, on that day in 2011, in, in January, March, April, and on that day back in 2001, I am in pattern, which is not good. We'll bring back, I should be able to overlay. I'm sorry. I'll bring up one from each. Okay, this is one graph taken in 2011 and one graph taken in January back in 2001. And it's almost uncanny how the body can repeat its distress when it is subluxated. These shapes are, I can, I can bring this over and, and overlay them. Uh, I was much colder on that day, which is why I had to move them, move them over. But when someone's in pattern and you graph them and compare graphs, it is very, very easy to have excellent feedback that they are in a uh, subluxated state. And this is why the scanner is more important clinically as valuable as the tool it is for doing screenings and explaining chiropractic, clinically the scanner is essential for knowing when and when not, a pa when to adjust and when not to adjust, when a patient is stuck in that sympathetic hyperstate or when they're clear. So I thank you for your time.